In today's video, we'll be looking at the first four episodes of the anime Orient, a world where demons known as Oni and Kishin rule humanity. The only hope the land of Hinamoto has are traveling bands of samurai, also known as Bushi, who fight the demons and will continue to do so until the lands of Hinamoto are back in the hands of humanity. If this is enough to pique your interest, then be sure to subscribe and click the bell in order to be notified of the next part of this recap so that you can hear the rest of the story as it unfolds. The land of Hinamoto was once a land of humans, but with the appearance of the demonic Kishin, their world was turned upside down. Many of the warring states lay down their weapons in despair, but there were still many warriors willing to fight. Those who stood up to the Kishin are known as the Bands of Bushi. The average human now worships Oni and Kishin, demons, as their gods. And Musashi, a red-haired minor boy, laments how crazy the world has become. He breaks rocks in the mine with his blood-red pickaxe while he gnashes his teeth in anger and frustration. Sometime later, he's sitting in class with the other mining students for a history lesson, where the teacher explains that the arrival of the Kashin was one of the best things to happen to the lower working classes, because they eliminated the inequality that kept them at the bottom rungs of society. Keeping a neutral face, Musashi denies this mentality, saying that the farmers were the ones who fought against the Kashin the hardest, that they were the heroes that tried to save humanity from the Kashin. We flash back to Musashi Musashi's childhood, where he's fighting his blonde friend with wooden swords in front of a dilapidated house. They are very evenly matched, and they finish their match by poking fun at each other's lacking fighting stance. As they're bickering about who's the better swordsman, a white-haired man with a scar covering the left side of his face steps out of the house, supporting himself with a cane, and tells them to take a rest for now. He calls them inside and explains to them that the only people willing to confront the Oni were the Bushin, who are fighting their demonic forces even now after humanity has accepted its fate as their inferiors, in the hopes of one day restoring to the world and giving the lands back to humanity, because only then will Hinemoto truly be free. The blonde boy is concerned that the Bushin won't be able to defeat the Oni once and for all, but Musashi tells him that they'll definitely win, because they're fighting together and they have each other's support. After he convinces the blonde boy that resistance isn't futile, he talks him into promising to become the strongest Bushin the world has ever known. The school bell snaps snaps Musashi out of this memory as the teacher announces that the boys are facing their entrance ceremony the next day, where they'll meet their Oni overlords. The class ends with the teacher instructing the boys to shout their dreams out loud, and they all say that they want to become miners, but Musashi can't bring himself to say the word Bushin out loud in front of everyone, which disheartens him, as it's happened before. Musashi leaves the school grounds, arriving again at the old house with the boarded up windows from his memory. Inside is a blonde man, Musashi's age, called Kojiro. Musashi steals himself before entering with his carefree smile again. He tries to make small talk, but Kojiro says he's busy. He asks if there's anything to eat, and Kojiro just tells him to go and eat at his dorm. Instead, Kojiro asks him if he should really be wasting his time here with him, with the entrance ceremony tomorrow. Musashi wants to talk to Kojiro about that, because he doesn't really want to end up being a miner like the others. At that point, Kojiro notices Musashi's blood-red pickaxe, which looks more like a double-sided scythe, and and Musashi explains that it is actually his Oni slaying katana. He's been training to fight with it in secret for a while, and he's now come to invite Kojiro to be a Bushi with him, just like they promised to each other back when they were kids. Kojiro smiles for a moment before turning serious again and declining. He and his father, the silver-haired man with a scar from their past, were descendants of Bushi, and Kojiro claims that before he died, he started telling them tall tales where Bushi were heroes instead of the bad guys. Musashi is shocked by by this, asking if Kojiro has given up on their promise. Kojiro responds that Musashi is the one who's given up, because he can't bring himself to say that he wants to become a Bushi at the end of class, instead saying that he wants to become a minor like the other students. This hit Musashi's sore spot, and he's left speechless. After a thorough verbal beating, Musashi tells Kojiro that he will prove him wrong by becoming a Bushi all by himself, and storms out of the house. Once he's out of earshot, Kojiro says after him that he deserves to have a normal life the life of a miner, instead of the life of a bushi like him. 
Kojiro is picking up trash a bit later, reminiscing about his childhood, where he sat in class learning about the bushi as something bad and to be hated, and oni as something good and to be revered. His training to become a bushi involved being chained to his own katana, as well as a steel ball to drag behind him to symbolize the hard life he's about to lead. Even when he was a kid, the people he passed on the street were looking at him like trash for being the son of a bushi. The next day is the opening ceremony and all the miners are very excited, but Musashi is depressed, and he keeps remembering the things Kojiro said to him yesterday. The priests of the Oni, who are wearing red devil's horns on their hats, are instructing the miners about the ceremony that's about to happen, and how to act around the Oni. But the only thing Musashi can think about is that this is his chance to slay a real Oni and prove Kojiro wrong. While he's lost in thought, his red pickaxe is taken away, but he accepts this as part of the ceremony. The big door in front of them opens, and they are led through the gate. At first, they're excited when they see the miners working diligently in the valley on the other side, but freeze when they see the Oni. They look like giant teddy bears with star shapes on their faces. They seem harmless enough until a miner collapses from exhaustion, and an Oni picks him up, opens its star-shaped mouth, and eats the miner whole, dropping the miner's pickaxe on the ground by its feet. The miner's students are all shocked by this, and the priests just tell them to grab their pickaxes and get to work for their Oni overlords. The only student who isn't shocked into paralysis is Musashi, who marches towards the Oni and promises to kill him. But when he reaches to his back for his red pickaxe, he remembers that it was taken away. Not giving up on his first kill, he grabs the pickaxe that the Oni dropped and starts attacking it, but does little to no damage with such a weak weapon. Kojiro snaps out of his daydreaming when he notices a package Musashi must have dropped and opens it up to find Musashi's notebooks. From them, he realizes that they are filled with sketches of Musashi's red pickaxe. Detailed descriptions of his fighting style that he thought of for this weapon, and that he must have really been serious about becoming a Bushi. Back at the Oni Mines, Musashi is being beaten into a pulp without his red pickaxe that he's been training with. The rest of the mining students are yelling at him to just stop and get to mining, give up on killing this Oni, and accept his new fate as a miner. But he screams at them that killing Oni is what Bushi do, so he has to kill this Oni no matter what. They correct him, saying that he's no Bushi, he's a miner, like they all are. One of the priests yells, Yes, isn't that what you said your dream was at the end of each school day, being a miner? Musashi pauses his attacks at this, and he screams back that he lied. His dream was to become a bushi all along. As if on cue, Kojiro comes riding through the open gates on a bushi motorcycle, carrying Musashi's red pickaxe, landing on the oni that was about to finish Musashi, stunning it and forcing it back. He throws Musashi his weapon and tells him that he saw his notebook full of his fighting styles, and that he now believes him about becoming becoming an oni-slaying bushi one day. Musashi catches his pickaxe and plants one end of it into the ground behind him. The onlookers think that he will not be able to pull his weapon out of the ground before the charging oni reaches him, but in reality, he uses the ground as a samurai would use a sheath, using the extra force from the pickaxe coming out of the ground for a more powerful attack. He does this just as the charging oni is about to pounce, and he cuts it in half. These minor oni with the star-shaped mouths are no match for Musashi's and Kojiro's combined power, and they all get sliced to bits while the two talk, finally agreeing to hunt and kill oni together as Bushi, shaking on it. All of a sudden, the ground shakes. The largest mountain in the mining fields shoots a red light into the sky. Musashi and Kojiro approach the valley the light created, where they see a big, egg-shaped bird eating miners and rocks. Musashi thinks this fight is going to be easy, and he slashes it in half. However, the insides of the Oni bird sprout pink tentacles, which connect the two sides of the Oni until it is whole again. Before they can react to this, the priests run to its aid with a pile of metal offerings, which the bird gulps down greedily, along with a couple of humans. It then bursts into red flames, and out of the inferno emerges a giant red Oni, a Kishin, with multiple arms and a giant round belly. There are halos of light surrounding its head and the gems on its shoulders. Knowing their limits, Musashi and Kojiro make a run for it on their motorcycle, but the giant Kashin crushes the earth under them, launching them through the air, and they land heavily. Musashi is knocked out cold, and Kenji tries protecting him, but while blocking the Kashin's attack with his katana, the Kashin simply picks him up by the blade and starts throwing him around. As he's being thrown around, Kojiro thinks to himself how strange it is that he hated this sword so much when he was a child, but now he can't even let go of it to save his life. 
Finally, the Kashin pins him with one of its hands and forcibly takes the katana from his grip, gulping it down. But just as the Kashin's mouth closes, Musashi is charging at it from the sidelines, jumping on top of the demon and climbing on it until he reaches its round belly, which he starts attacking relentlessly, while also dodging the Kashin's attacks. Finally, the rock-hard skin of the Kashin belly breaks, and Musashi falls into its cavernous belly. The Oni falls over from the damage, and Musashi emerges shortly after with Kojiro's sword, handing it back to his friend. But before they could celebrate their first kill, a giant samurai fortress is approaching through the air on a small floating island towards the valley. It approaches the red force field the Oni Valley was protected by, presses up against it, and the red force field breaks. From their fortress, Bushi fly in on their motorbikes, the same kind Kojiro has. The incoming Bushi take hold of their glowing katana, and they fly into the air towards the fight. They land and order our protagonists to move out of the way and evacuate like the rest of the civilians. But Musashi protests loudly, saying that they are Bushi too, and that this is about to be their first target. One of the Bushi asks him if he really thinks that such a small wound would even hinder such a Kashin. And as they say so, the Kashin's belly sprouts the pink tentacles from before, and it stitches the hole in its belly until it seems unscathed and it writes itself. The Bushi divide into two teams. The green team, that shoots glowing green ropes from their katana to ensnare the Kashin and hold it in place, while while the other team flies into the air, into a pattern in the sky reminiscent of a constellation, preparing for a big attack. Just as the Bushi in the sky are gathering their energy for an attack, Musashi attacks the Kashin, breaking it free from its restraints, and it dodges the beam attack at the last second. They were targeting its weakness, the core horn, a crystal poking out of its belly, and Kojiro relays this information to Musashi, who moves in to destroy it. However, his katana breaks on contact, and he's saved from the Kashin's flames at the last second by the Bushi Lord Takeda Neatora, who slashes at the core horn with his glowing katana, cutting it neatly in two. The Kashin's flames go out, and it keels over dead. The Bushi leader apologizes to Musashi for stealing his kill, but apologizes for stealing his thunder. They jump down from the Kashin, which begins to disintegrate into flying sparkles, which the celebrating Bushi are gathering into their swords. Musashi is about to pick a fight with Lord Takeda back on the ground, but the Bushi does doesn't take him seriously. Instead, he gives him a giant crystal on a string as a necklace, telling him to use it to find his next target. Back at their hideout, as Kojiro and Musashi are preparing to head out on their journey to find and kill Oni and Kashin, while packing, they go through the scrolls Kojiro's dad showed them when they were little, and they look at the illustrations, noticing a Bushi on the picture holding something to his eye. They realize it's the long crystal Lord Takeda left them to fight the Kashin, and looking through it, they see the same symbol as is shown in the middle of the painting. They leave the town on Kojiro's Bushi motorcycle, and the first few days of their journey are a breeze. They know they'll spend a lot of time together from now on, so they vow not to argue. This becomes harder and harder as their food supplies dwindle, and the road gets harder and harder to traverse, with their motorcycle either breaking down, so they have to push it. The lack of food finally makes them have an argument, so they go fishing, and Kojiro catches one fish after another, gloating to Musashi about it. Annoyed, Musashi goes to another part of the river to catch his own fish. After some time on their own, Kojiro realizes that gloating about his fishing skills was immature, and after not catching anything, Musashi also realizes that he should apologize. He goes back to the spot where he left Kojiro alone, but he finds him on the ground with a head wound. He regains consciousness and tries to warn him, but not early enough, because a green-haired girl ambushes Musashi, pinning him to the ground. Musashi fights her off easily, because even though she has some fighting skills, she's as light as a feather to him. Realizing that she can't win through brute force, she pretends to give up, slowly revealing her bosom to Musashi in surrender. Just as the girl is about to strike, Musashi parries her attack and pins her to the ground instead, jokingly berating Kojiro for falling for it. The girl suddenly rolls up the sleeves of her kimono to reveal black weapons attached to her forearms, with blades springing out of them. But a horn in the distance breaks her out of her fighting stance, and she runs towards the horn, worrying she'll be late to make it back to her people in time, she steals Kojiro's motorcycle and rides away. Furious, Musashi and Kojiro follow her tracks to another Bushi fortress, the sign on the entrance saying, Kosameti Band. They enter
enter and start sneaking their way through the dark corridors. Inside, the green-haired girl is reporting to her lord for bringing him to Bushi and their motorcycle. We learn their names are Lord Kosomedo Hideo, and the girl's name is Hattori Sagumi. She asks for further orders from her lord, and he gives her instructions. She meets Musashi and Kojiro in the darkened hallways of the fortress, apologizes for stealing their bike, and promises to return it to them if they follow her. Having no choice in the matter in enemy territory, our two protagonists agree and follow her. She leads them to the back of the fortress, where the floating island the fortress is built on is covered in a small town, and she explains that a fort with a town is called a castle. She also explains that the townspeople are not Bushi, but they help the cause by growing food, forging weapons, and crafting armor, and the children are sometimes called Bushi. While Sugumi spars with two local children, Musashi and Kojiro consider this town and decide that it wouldn't be too bad to be a part of a Bushi band like this. Taking a break, Sugumi reveals that this town and the Bushi band feel like one big family, but that in reality, she has no blood relatives here. She reveals nothing more. She flashes back to her older sister, remembering how she died to an Oni, holding the same weapons she uses herself. Our protagonists are then brought up to the lord of the Bushi band, Lord Kosameda who treats them to a luxurious feast. Musashi and Kojiro find this suspicious and ask him for his motives for treating them so nicely. And Lord Kosameda explains that he wishes that they could join his Bushi band and share some of their kitetsu. Musashi asks what that is, and the mood takes a turn for the worse. Lord Kosameda announces that these two are useless to him and orders Sugumi to bind them and bring them to the dungeons for interrogation. As Musashi and Kojiro are locked up in the dungeon, Sugumi is forced to repeat to her lord that she is stupid and useless until he's satisfied. He then announces that, with the approaching Oni, he will have to order total mobilization of the castle. Sugumi is horrified by this, wringing her robe in despair, knowing that full mobilization means enlisting the civilians, the women, the elderly, even the children, to act as cannon fodder for the Bushi to hide behind. Lord Kosameda simply reminds her that she is utterly useless without him, and Sugumi backs down, repeating that she is worthless without her lord, and asks asks for orders again. Secretly, she approaches Musashi and Kojiro in the dungeons and interrogates them if they really don't have any kitetsu. They insist that they don't know what kitetsu is, and she explains that it's the floating sparkles the other Bushi band sucked up into their sword after the Red Kashin died. She explains it's the thing Bushi need to fight the Oni, and their band needs it desperately, because there is a giant herd of Oni heading their way. Thinking about total mobilization makes her ring her kimono again, which Musashi notices and asks her what kind of emotions she's bottling up for her hands to be doing such a thing. Sugumi internally screams that she doesn't want the townspeople to die, but just as the words are about to bubble up out of her mouth, she clutches it shut and runs away, screaming that she can't let herself think such thoughts. Will our protagonists break free from the dungeon? Will Sugumi take Musashi's advice and oppose Lord Kosameda? And how will the town survive the upcoming Oni attack? If you want to find out, then subscribe if you haven't already, and click the bell to be notified when we release the next part of our Orient Recap.